Good morning. It's time to talk fairy tales. This week we're taking a closer look at some stories that may already be near and dear to your heart in the hope that we can make some room for new insights into their themes, origins, and the tensions they explore. And as part of doing that, we're going to talk about chapter 10 from our textbook, Straw into Gold Fairy Tale Philology. One of the first issues that Lehrer addresses in the chapter is this question of authorship. I think many of us have kind of a vague sense that fairy tales are the product of folklore, right? Um, and that in some way they're timeless, they're authorless, they've sprung from the land itself. You know, they start out once upon a time and we believe them. And there's a thread of truth to this, but it's not the whole picture. Lehrer takes care to distinguish that fairy tales as a genre have a connection to oral traditions of folklore, um, but they also bear the influence of specific authors and editors, which makes them a reflection of specific times and places. You see somewhat of a spectrum with fairy tales uh, between those on the one hand that really closely conserve their connection to folklore and have a direct provenance from the forms and the stock figures of this tradition to those that we might consider more individual uh, literary products, meaning that they could truly be traced to a specific author. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at both types. In either case, whether they are retellings of oral folklore or more individually authored stories, we see that the themes and narratives of fairy tales often are designed as a sort of commentary on how to kind of navigate specific social environments and contexts. Lehrer says it that they're full of social criticism meant to offer moral instruction under the guise of fantasy. So on the one hand, as he asserts on page 209, uh, fairy tales are full of what you might think of as familiar forms, stock figures, patterns of events, right? We see obedient daughters, evil stepmothers, strange creatures in expected settings like a dark forest. And these sort of expected features are one of the ways that we trace the provenance of fairy tales as a genre back to their roots and their heritage in folklore. Interestingly enough, there's a whole system of classification that's designed to trace exactly these kind of patterns, and it's called the Arn thompson uther type. Um, it provides classifications that are sort of ways of organizing folktales by common figures or thematic elements. So for example, if you're looking at the bottom of the PDFs for this week's readings, you might notice that Cinderella is labeled as Type 510A, which is stories of persecuted heroines, uh, which are to be seen as distinct, for example, from Hansel and Gretel, which is Type 327A, stories of abandoned children. At the same time that we see these sort of familiar forms, though, we also really observe fairy tales grappling with what you might call timely themes and considerations. A good place to look for this combination is in the work of the Brothers Grimm. They were German linguists and scholars who were very interested in the roots of language. And so the story goes that they, you know, kind of traveled around the German countryside, sort of crowdsourcing folklore and recording this into these big volumes of what they called Kinder und Hausmarchen, um, or nursery and fairy tales. Nope, sorry, wrong translation. Nursery and household tales. I'm tired today. <laughs> So the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm were some of those that did more closely conserve their connection to folklore, but they were also very adept at inserting what you might consider these kind of timely themes. As Lehrer puts it, they calibrated their tales to sort of meet the audience of their time, adding uh, motifs from Christian proverbs. He gives us a recipe of sorts on page 216 for sort of how the Grimm's cooked up their fairy tales. Lara says that they synthesized folk stories with personal remembrances and an already rich tradition of literary fairy tales. 
So rather than serving us kind of pure primeval fantasy, the Brothers Grimm are definitely delivering fairy tales with relevant concerns to the audience of their day, which includes these kind of emergent themes of what you might call a philosophical discourse on love and family, especially parental ties. Lehrer notes on page 213 that in the 18th century, there was this emergence of, as he says, the idea of affection as a defining criterion of family goodness. So essentially, the kind of new sense that you measured your success as a parent by the level of affection in your family, which is kind of modern. And for that reason, we see a lot of the stories from the Brothers Grimm kind of grappling with questions about the nature of a parent's love. Was it inherently biological? Um, Part of this is kind of exploring tension about new arrangements of families. So we see concern about step parents, for example, remarriage and reconfiguration of the family. This is also a time of increasing industrialization in the 1800s in Europe. So we kind of start to see these stories that are playing around with uh, themes of economic aspiration and upward mobility. This is a time when members of farming communities were moving into urban spaces, right? So sometimes the stories will show this rewarded, or other times they'll kind of warn of the dangers of, of wanting to live beyond your station. Interestingly, and you might say related, although I don't think the 1800s are the only time that people were interested in this theme, we also see this element of tales of transformation and disguised worth. Now, if the Brothers Grimm are sort of editing and revising folklore in such a way to make it uniquely appeal to their audience, there are also authors who are interested in doing something completely new like Hans Christian Andersen. One of the key figures that we meet in this chapter, he's a Danish writer who began publishing in the 1830s. And as Lehrer puts it, he used his writing to make a fairy tale out of his own life. Hans Christian Andersen is best known for, again, what we might consider these more literary fairy tales that are very unique products of a specific author. Stories such as The Snow Queen, Uh, The Ugly Duckling, and The Little Mermaid, which are original literary products. So the sense of ownership between author and story is much more like the modern conception of how you might think of it today. And we'll be taking a look at some of Hans Christian Andersen's writing next week. As a final aside, While you're completing this week's readings, you might become aware of a phenomena of what Lehrer terms on page 224 as the modern saccharinization of fairy tales, which saccharin means to make overly sweet. I would term this as kind of the sort of sticker shock of an adult reader who returns to take a closer look at the original text after having maybe grown up on the Disney version. As Lehrer puts it, it's what anyone who returns to the original Grimm sees. The deep horror in the tales, the gruesomeness, the tragedy. And it's no joke, not all fairy tales have happy endings, right? I think about in particular the example of Snow White, where the evil stepmother is punished in the Grimm's version by being forced to dance in red hot iron shoes until she died. That's a lot different than accidentally falling off a cliff, right? And to me, it points to the fact that there's a very distinct world of winners and losers in the original versions of these fairy tales. There's a system of reward and punishment. And this can actually tell us a lot about their embedded values and tensions. So that's all from me for now. I look forward to having a conversation with you throughout this week.